Hey, Rebecca, I have a scenario for you. Ooh, okay, great. This is it. Um, imagine that somebody comes to you for coaching and they say, I don't feel like I'm a leader. Okay, why do you not feel like you're a leader? Tell me more about that. Well, this is what they're saying. I don't feel like a leader because I don't have the title and I don't have the decision-making authority and I don't have the office. What would you say to that person? Really? You think that's what makes you a leader? Yeah. Are you saying that it's something different? Yeah, absolutely. A leader is someone who has the ability to influence and encourage people through their actions, period. That's what makes a leader. Those other things do not. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with you. Okay, JB, you know what? <laughs> Maybe today's guest is going to help you see this a little more clearly. Because today's guest is Valerie Cockrell, former leader in retail and merchandise, and she's going to share her greatest accomplishment, her greatest adversity, and she's also going to tell us how leaders make an impact through influence. So get your notebook out and take some notes. You convinced me. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Welcome. I'm your host, JB Adams. And I'm your host, Rebecca Morgan. In this series, we bring you conversations with experienced leaders. Because a leader is anyone who influences change, we want to understand not just what leaders do, but who they are and how they can be effective in a rapidly changing world. We hope you'll learn some things about our guests, about our topic, and also about yourself. This is Leadership Life Stories. You can find episodes of this and all other Victor Media Group shows on our website at victormediagroup.co. And if you like what you're hearing, subscribe and connect with us on your favorite social media platform. We'll be right back after this important message. Well, hi there, listeners. It's Rebecca Morgan. If you told my younger self you are going to love talking about leadership, and when you grow up, you will lead hundreds and develop thousands of managers and leaders and create great places to work, I would have laughed at the idea because I was focused on becoming a dolphin trainer. Yeah, while I still love dolphins, what I really love to do is leadership development. So much so that I created the Awesome Leader League, the ultimate collection of people-centered leadership skills to help you be a better leader. If you're looking for ways to become more confident and an effective people-centered leader that people will trip over their own feet to follow, this is your resource. And did I mention we do it in 20 minutes or less? Join us now at theawesomeleaderleague.com. Welcome to Leadership Life Stories. I'm Rebecca Morgan and my co-host is JB Adams. This season of Leadership Life Stories is devoted to examining Disney leadership as the Walt Disney World Resort celebrates its 50th anniversary. Today's episode is part two of a two-part interview with Valerie Cockrell. She's a native of France. Her Disney career started with the fellowship at Epcot World Showcase, and from there she moved into leadership roles in retail and merchandise at Disneyland Paris, the Walt Disney World Resort, and Disney Cruise Line. She currently serves as one half of the partnership that is Cockrell Consulting, which provides training, consulting, and coaching to leaders and organizations to build a great culture and deliver outstanding customer service. This segment is called The Greatest Accomplishment, and it gives us a chance to understand how leaders define success. Now, JB, I have a question for you. Yes? Remember when we started this podcast and we were going over like the questions we were proposing to ask the guests? Yes. And I was like greatest accomplishment. And remember I was fighting you on that. I'm like <laughs> greatest accomplishment. I was like, I don't know. That's such a weird question. Like, I don't know. If but the question it's because... is, do you remember us fighting? Yes. Um, <laughs> right, 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 right. Imagine that it's feedback, JB. It's not fighting. It's feedback. <laughs> um, but do you remember we were talking about it and I was like, mm, I don't know. This question feels weird. And I think Valerie Cockrell totally explains why, like why it feels weird to me. Okay, cool. Well, that's a great setup for this segment. So listeners, how do you define success? And do you think the question is weird? Be thinking about that as you listen to Valerie Cockrell's definition. There's different ways to look at success. First of all, I think you look at um, personally, for me, my biggest success probably would have to be my family and being able to raise three kids who are nice, kind, funny, loving children while having careers with Disney, which can be a very demanding company in the sense that if you work for operation, you know, it's 365 day operation. So 
being able to do that and with both parents, you know, with my husband also working for Disney, and we stayed married <laughs> through the process. We've been married 27 years, going on 28. We work together and we live together now. So that's, that, again, to me, I look at this as successful. And this is where I find my gratification. Let's put it this way. Um, the other thing is, I think success, when you think about it in terms of other people, uh, it's how you get to influence them. And whenever I can influence somebody to try something new, to be curious, to venture out, to look into more diverse world and options and everything, I find this, to me, if I can do this successfully, this is where I get great gratification. I was just in France and I met a young guy who was 23 years old. He worked in a factory and he was telling me that he, he bought a machine. He said, I don't have any skills, but I want to clean windows and I want to clean carpets and detail cars. And I'm going to have a big cleaning company and I'm going to start that business. And I want to learn about American level of service. And I'm like, perfect, let's sit down. And I'd love to help young people like this because he doesn't start from much, but he's willing to put in the hard work and he's willing to ask questions and learn from other people. And let me tell you, we spent a couple of hours and I said, here's what you can do. You know, call people ahead of time, confirm your appointment, which is a huge challenge in, in France. So service is not quite uh, to the level of American standards. So he has a huge opportunity there and I believe in him. I'm like, hey, go for it. So success for me is successfully helping people, influencing them in a way so they become successful themselves. I love how you describe just making an impact and I can relate to uh, how that definitely feels like a successful accomplishment. Just curious, Valerie, do you have an example from your career, something that you would consider an accomplishment? If you ask professionally in terms of project and everything, I think the the Millennium Project and the, the disruption that came with it when I worked at Epcot, that was uh, incredible. I remember setting up the Millennium Village behind the UK Pavilion, and you had Saudis and Israelis and Brazilian and people from Eritrea. And so that, that in itself was a successful accomplishment, I think. Yes. I want to make one more connect the dots moment. You defined success as being influential, helping people see things in a new way. In the context of something that was a big project and required a lot of effort on your part, the Millennium Project, what was a moment where you were influential or helped someone see things in a new way that changed the course of that project? I think my job at the time, the nature of my job was to act as a connection between the operation and the buying office. And I, it, it could be very uncomfortable at time because you controlled neither the operation, not the buying, right? But you had to make sure that first there wasn't too much finger pointing going from one side to the other. And then you had to make sure that everybody that it, you had a win-win scenario to bring to the table and you had to have some sensibility with the product. And I, I really enjoy this and you had to understand the cultures and I'll, I'll tell you a story of one of the things, I don't know if I'm getting off topic here and, and, but that's something I was very passionate about is making sure that the frontline in the world showcase understood what was going on. And Rebecca alluded to it earlier, and I enjoy doing walkthrough of World Showcase, meeting the cast from all the different countries and getting their input and sharing with them information. And I can tell you one, here's a funny story. At the German Pavilion, in, if you born and raised in Europe, like I was, they, they used to retail a Kinder Egg, a chocolate egg that had a yellow capsule inside that had a little toy. And for many, many years, this Kinder Egg was not retailed in the US. And when I worked at Epcot back then, every time I'd walk into the German Pavilion, there would be cast members saying, why don't we sell the Kinder Egg? And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. Let me find out. So I would go back to the buying office. I said, why don't we sell this thing? 
And eventually the buyer came back and said to me, the reason why we can't sell it, it doesn't pass the test in America. It is considered unsafe because children can bite into this yellow capsule, swallow the capsule and choke. It was a quick answer, a simple answer. And I made a point of going back to the German pavilion and letting the cast members know. And once I told them that was the end of that request, but for months and months and months before I got there, there was this huge frustration of the, the cast member going like, you know, it's a bestseller in Germany. Why don't we sell it? And there was a simple explanation for it. So I love being that person, the one who connects the dots. And that job for me was that that's probably where I feel I felt the most successful or maybe the most impactful because I could do that for the organization. Yes, it's a big deal. It's a yes. big deal. Yes. And I'd like to be to believe to maybe that my greatest uh, success has yet to come. All right, JB, what did you think about Valerie's greatest accomplishment? I love what she said about influencing other people to try new things. And that's how she defines success. That to me is leadership. Everything we do in life is a approaching new situations, things that we've never encountered before, having that courage, that kind of attitude is what we all need to have when it comes to um, approaching our definition of success and our accomplishments. So that's what we're trying to do with this show. I, I just love that. What did you uh, think? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I love that she believes that her greatest success is yet to come. This forward thinking, I totally can get behind. I love it. Our guest is Valerie Cockrell, and when we come back, we're going to hear about her greatest adversity, and we're going to talk about something we've been avoiding this entire interview up until now. It's time to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Can't wait. Welcome back to Leadership Life Stories. I'm Rebecca Morgan. My co-host is JB Adams, and our guest is Valerie Cockrell former leader in Disney retail and merchandise and current leadership coach and partner at Cockrell Consulting. This segment is called The Greatest Adversity, and it's where we acknowledge that leaders are human and each of us has challenges to face. Now, usually we start this segment by asking the guests to name their greatest adversity. But before we do that, today we're gonna to play a little clip for you. Um, it's the beginning of a conversation that we had with Valerie Cockrell in a previous segment, and it was about the hard work of leadership. There's really no magic, you know, you hear my father-in-law all the time talk about how it's not the magic that makes it work, it's the way we work that makes it magic, right? So he's absolutely right, it's basic things, but people are just realize how hard it is and they, they wish there was something else, so. So Valerie, for the sake of our listeners, uh, please tell them who your father-in-law is. Oh, um, so Lee Cockrell, my father-in-law, um, was executive vice president of Walt Disney World. And while we at it, I might as well mention my husband, Dan, who was vice president of the Magic Kingdom when he left Disney in 2018. So we have a long history uh, with the Disney company. As a matter of fact, I'll share an anecdote. I started with Disney back in 1987. I was the first of the cockerel relatives to ever work for Disney in 1987. And then Dan was in the college program in 1989. And then Lee joined Disneyland Paris, Euro Disney in 90, and he was transferred to Walt Disney World in 93. Dan and I were working at Disneyland Paris from 91 to 97. And then Lee stayed with Disney until 2006. Dan stayed with Disney until 2018. I left Disney in 2019. Every single one of our three kids have worked for Disney, but the youngest worked this past year at the French Pavilion at Epcot, and he just left August 12th, 2021. So as of August 12th, this is the first time in, I believe, 34 years that yes. there's no cockerel working for Disney. So we had a good, uh, we had a good run. <laughs> a long family legacy. Yes. Valerie was the first in the family to be hired at Disney. Mm -hmm. And this led to 34 years of the cockerel family working for Disney, which is a lot to celebrate. Very much. Yeah, they're an amazing family and so closely tied to the Disney brand. I think that's really something special. 
Now that you know that background information, let's listen to Valerie Cockrell talk about her greatest adversity. I think some of the adversity, I mean, the difficult thing I've had to deal with is I, I, I willingly did it. It's not something that that was an issue to me. It's something that I kind of dove into. You know, I moved to London when I didn't speak English. I agreed to come to the US, work for Disney when I had no idea what a theme park or what Disney was. So it was hard, but I, I willingly did it. <laughs> you know, I set myself for for this. So I, I don't think I had adversity. I've had things that were difficult to deal with. And the one that comes to mind for me that was totally unexpected is when I left Disney in Paris and came to Walt Disney World. And suddenly I'm working in an environment where, you know, your father-in-law is the ex executive vice president. And it, it's hard to deal with. I'm sure a lot of people out there will think, well, you know, lucky her, things must have come real easy. And, and maybe it did in, I don't know, but wh what I can tell you is that in the back of your mind, every time somebody gives you a compliment, every time, if you get a promotion, if you get, you know, uh, anything positive, you always somewhat second guess yourself and think, well, are they just saying this because I'm Valerie Cockrell or are they saying this because I'm deserving? Um, also when you don't receive feedback. And are people shying away from giving me feedback because of who I am? Or do they have an agenda or do they have something in mind? So the first couple of years, it was tough. And, and I, I don't know, we never discussed it really with Dan. I'm sure Dan went through the same thing, but that was something that was totally unexpected. In France, I was just nobody. Walt Disney World was a whole different thing. So this is my interpretation. You were second guessing the relationships that you had with people around you and asking yourself if you could trust people. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because when people are gushing with compliments and everything, you're like, well, is that genuine <laughs> or and, and that I struggled with that for, for a little bit. And I, I found myself, it was funny because the people who would give me feedback, negative feedback, I was so thrilled. I'm like, oh, thank you. I just, you know, that's why I have so much respect for Liz because she would be willing to say it like it is. And I'm like, I want to learn. If I don't do something well, please tell me. I have the same thing in English when I speak. My English is decent enough that people understand me. And there are words that I don't pronounce well or things that are grammatically incorrect and people don't correct me. And I'm like, please correct me. You won't offend me. When I taught at Disney Institute, I was always tell the participants, I said, look, if at any given time I say something and you don't understand, please let me know. You're not going to offend me. I will be happy to repeat, rephrase, reformulate. I will do what it takes, but you're not going to hurt my feelings. Well, it was kind of that thing when I worked at Walt Disney World, it was the same thing. I, I was trying to tell people, please tell me, but feedback was quite a rare commodity when I worked there. So negative feedback, that is not positive feedback. Valerie, what do you think the takeaway is from this? And what advice would you give to others who are facing a similar kind of adversity? I think, you know, when you start second guessing yourself, you have to let it go, <laughs> just uh, to quote Elsa, right? You have to be able to rise beyond this. And Dan's grandfather had a great quote. He said, do your best and then forgive yourself. And interestingly enough, we have different interpretation of that quote. My interpretation is do your best, you know, put your best foot forward, apply yourself, do your best you can and then sometimes you have to come to the realization that what you do is not good enough or somebody will be better than you and it's okay and you have to learn to live with that so forgive yourself and learn from it and move on and so that's that kind of became my my way of dealing with that particular issue all right i, I have a similar question but it's if you and I met at work and I would say, oh, hi, nice to meet you. I don't know who you are. We have to work together. Great. And then someone said, oh, this is my last name. And I'd be like, oh, now I have to watch what I say. Because that's the first thing they're going to think. I have to watch what I say. Mm -hmm. And I guess you have to go through and say, 
look, I, I have my own identity. Yes, this is my last name. You and I can build a relationship. Like, do you have to give them permission to sort of break through that? Yeah, I and you're absolutely right. I did at times. There were moments, and I remember several conversations I had when I was at Disney when I would tell people, I said, Look, I just want you to understand when we at the dinner table, we never talk about Disney. We work at Disney. We don't, I never in a million years would have occurred to me to go to my father in law and say, I have this problem, and so and so is causing chaos or whatever. I never, we never would do anything like this. And I'll tell you one thing, knowing my father-in-law, had I done this, it would not have been well received. So I, because it's just not something that is professional, I think. And they were, and Dan never did it with his dad. I never did it with his dad. And Dan and I never did it amongst ourselves. I think the two of us worked briefly together at Epcot. We sat in one meeting together, Dan and I, Sometimes he would tease me, he would say, I heard my retail location is out of their number one t-shirt. And that would be it. We never, ever would discuss work. First of all, because we were tired. At the end of the day, you spend 10, 12 hours at Disney. The last thing you want to go is go home and talk about more Disney stuff. Please, you know, get me out of this. <laughs> so, uh, but, but sometimes people, I think, were under the impression that maybe I'd go home and start plotting with my husband or my father-in-law about my next move. And gosh, no, it cannot be further than the truth. Well, oh, you know, I just, I just want to add something. I think Disney has the biggest rumor mill <laughs> you can think of. And it's, it's crazy, the stories that go around. And when you know the truth behind it, it is mind boggling. I don't know. Some people sit around and just make up stories, I guess. I love that. And it uh, lends credence to what we always used to say. Disney is a storytelling company. <laughs> and it really no is. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Rebecca, what is your reflection on listening to Valerie Cockrell's greatest adversity? Okay, what Valerie shared about adversity and choosing to do difficult and hard things really connected with me. And that quote that she shared from her, I guess it would be her grandfather-in-law, Dan's grandfather, do your best and then forgive yourself, is like going up on the wall. Because how many times do we beat ourselves up, replaying conversations and situations in our minds and wish it didn't happen this way or wish it went that way. And next time this happens, I'm gonna do this. You know what? Keep going, keep doing your best and getting better. Love that. We all have to move on. We all have to move on. Okay, what about you, JB? Uh, I'm in complete agreement. Um, so I would start with my expression of empathy. I could understand what Valerie Cockrell was describing when she said the second guessing and the not knowing if people were being genuine with you. And, and I think what it points out to me is that all of us need to uh, address our own biases. There is an opportunity to get to know someone on their own terms, and we all need to be ready to make that move as leaders and as just good human beings. Exactly. Have the courage to do that. Our guest is Valerie Cockrell, and when we come back, we're going to hear her best advice for leaders. So please stay with us. Welcome back to Leadership Life Stories. I'm Rebecca Morgan. My co-host is JB Adams, and our guest is Valerie Cockrell, former leader in Disney retail and merchandise and current leadership coach and partner at Cockrell Consulting. Valerie, so you left Disney in 2019. Tell us what you're up to now. Well, my husband and I started a, he started a consulting company in 2018. And when I left Disney Institute, I started gradually, it wasn't the plan, but gradually I started working with him. And now we help organization, not only in the hospitality industry, but also we have clients who are accounting firms, realtors, colleges, some of them we work with. So we help anybody and sometimes it's one person one individual sometimes it's an entire organization and uh, we have fun we travel a lot we spend a lot of time on the road which we again that's something travel travel travels always been on my agenda so i'm we we happily do this we have a home base in colorado right south of boulder but we spend about i would say about half of the year on the road 
And we also spend an extensive period of time in Europe. And Valerie, what's a typical type of problem that a client brings to you? What kind of solutions are they looking for? A lot of it is mainly about culture. You know, uh, we want to have people who are empowered, who love the organization. We want to retain our people. We want to motivate them and we help them formalize this again you know people kind of get the sense of what they need to do they just don't know how to put together a framework to do this effectively so mm -hmm. we help them do that and then there's the service aspect of this a lot of organizations say how can i deliver a service just the way disney does so we we help them brainstorm and come up with ideas and enhance their service so wonderful Valerie, what's a regular practice? It could be a book or a resource that you recommend for leaders. I'm an avid reader. I read quite a bit. There's some, a uh, couple of favorite books I can think of. I'm a big fan of Mindset by Carol Dweck. I wish I had read yes. that book and heard about growth mindset and fixed mindset when I was in my 20s. I'm also a big fan of Thomas Friedman, who's a great writer for the New York Times. I read two of his books, The World is Flat, and the most recent one, which is thank you for being late. And if you feel overwhelmed by the speed of change today, mm -hmm. I highly recommend you read thank you for being late because, you know, he explains everything and has some great recommendation there. Also, I read a long time ago, a book called the end of poverty, and it's written by a, a economist called Jeffrey Sachs. And uh, if you recall the Millennium Project, not the Disney Millennium Project, but the actual Millennium Project where their goal was to limit poverty, extreme poverty in the world. So he wrote a book about this and it, again, so much common sense. You read this and you're like, of course, why don't we do this? And he pretty much explains that we've been putting band-aids on poverty for mm -hmm. a long time, but we never done something that could eradicate it in the effective way, you know? So. The book is all about that. It's a kind of a big book, but it's something I refer to a lot because this we travel a lot and we go to a lot of countries that are third world countries. And I always think of that book. So that's kind of my, I don't know, maybe in my top three books, I guess. So Valerie Cockrell, we have just scratched the surface in getting to know you, but we are very grateful to have some time to spend with you. And when you think back, to that young lady, the one we called the troublemaker, the one who was <laughs> determined to learn English and travel the world. What advice would you give to that young person now? Just keep being curious and understand that it just never ends. You just have to keep learning and keep discovering things and there's beauty and diversity and and try to open your mind i may not be i'm not the most open-minded person i tend to be very stubborn with my ideas but fortunately i'm very curious so i'm still willing to hear the other end of the of a argument so i would say to myself keep doing this because this is where you learn and you expand your horizon and you become smarter along the way and more tolerant of differences and you realize you have blind spots and you realize you have shortcomings and you have weaknesses and all of that is good knowing all of that is good so don't be in denial it's not a good it's never a good place to be okay valerie i'm really sad about this but we're about to wrap up our time so thinking about what has brought us all together this examination of disney leadership on the 50th anniversary of walt disney world what would you like to share with our listeners you know, our times are very dark right now. A lot of people have a very pessimistic view of the future. And I, I don't agree. I think uh, younger generation ha have now exposure to much more than before. They have access to a lot of knowledge. Education is readily available. And I would say, you know, if you look at all this and think about all this, the future is bright. But in order to have some positive outcome, people will have to go and reach out and, and be willing to listen. So we have that. We have the technology. We have the capability to do it. And I think young people travel a lot more than we did in my, my generation. 
They are aware of a lot more than my generation. They use technology far better than I ever will. So that gives me hope that, yes, we heading towards a bright future. So stay positive, you know, don't let the media and all the negative stuff blur your vision of the future. So. Valerie Cockrell, thank you so much for joining us on Leadership Life Stories and sharing your story. Always uh, happy to talk to you guys. So thanks for having me. So Rebecca, what are your reflections on what Valerie Cockrell said? You know, I love that she talks about never stop learning, be curious, keep discovering. And I have an idea, JB, I think we need to put together a book list. She shared some incredible books. I think we should put them in the show notes. How about you? What do you think? First, I agree with you. And our books are always mentioned in the show notes. So go check those out. <laughs> and I would also add uh, one thing that she said really got me. She said, our times are very dark right now. I agree, um, they are. But I love how she ended by saying that the future is bright. And as leaders, it is our job to be optimistic about the future. So she just embodies that optimism to me. Right, oh, so good. This brings us to the end of part two of a two-part interview with Valerie Cockrell. In our next episode, we will be back with another Disney leader. And with that, I would like to say, Rebecca Morgan, thank you for being my co-host on Leadership Life Stories. I never stop learning new things from you. You're awesome. And I couldn't do it without you. Thank you, JB. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon with another episode. You can find Leadership Life Stories and all other Victor Media Group podcasts at victormediagroup.co. Leadership Life Stories was created by J.B. Adams and executive produced by Gerard Mitchell. Today's episode was co-hosted by Rebecca Morgan and J.B. Adams. Sound design by Michael Orlowski, mixing and editing by Manny Simone. It's the mission of Victor Media Group to make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. If you like this show, follow us at Victor Media Group on your favorite social media platform. This is J.B. Adams. And until next time, remember, if you can dream it, you can do it.